Well, good evening. My name is John Goldingay. I've been asked to chair this evening's session, and I um, I feel privileged and glad to be able to introduce to you uh, Rabbi Norman Solomon, uh, who's going to talk about this book of his uh, called uh, Making Sense of God, about which I feel tempted to say that I'm glad that God makes sense of us. Well, perhaps God doesn't, because that's rather a more difficult thing, probably even than us making sense of God. I don't know. Uh, on the back of the book, uh, it says tells you that Norman Solomon was born in Cardiff, that his career has included periods as a pulpit rabbi, a university lecturer, and an interfaith consultant. Um, I first met Norman some 30 years ago when both of us were members of an interfaith um, study group at Leo Beck College in London. Uh, when uh, he was living uh, and working in Birmingham, which was a threat to me, because that's where I come from, you see. And so when I meet anybody who works in Birmingham, I feel at home. Uh, but I was in Nottingham at the time. Uh, then uh, I was off in the United States for 20 years or so and came back to find, came back to live in Oxford uh, and found Norman here. Uh, and so it's been a delight to me to be able to make contact with him again uh, and to be engaged once more in discussions of interfaith questions with him, uh, as well as things at the uh, uh, Leah at the Leah, Leah at the Muller uh, Library Centre uh, in Oxford. So I'm glad to be able to introduce uh, Norman to you for those of you who need him to be introduced, and we're looking forward uh, to hearing you talk about this book. And the plan is he's going to spend uh, a chunk of time talking about it um, and then you will get the chance to quiz him about some of the questions that he will have raised in talking about make a sense of god norman over to you well uh, thank you very much john for your kind words and uh, happy memories uh, with which we have uh, shared together and hello everybody i have seen some friends here. I hope um, that we are all friends. Um, and um, impossible for me to say hello individually. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about the book fairly straightforwardly, work through it and how it's come together, what it's about. And after that, please put any questions that you like. So uh, I will share my screen with you. And we will see what this is all doing. From beginning, right. I am. I hope everybody can see this perfectly well. You just have the title there. We move on. This is bibliographic information. And never mind that. Book falls into four parts. Part one is my orientation, how the journey began, and it is a journey that I'm describing rather than uh, a scholarly analysis of some particular problem. This is where it began. With me at about uh, the age of, say, 12, and I was sent along to the synagogue. This is uh, where I stand. My orientation is from the synagogue, and I had to learn a bit of Hebrew and I translated the words by Adabir Hashem al Moshe Lemar, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying. And two questions used to come into my mind, and I would sit in the synagogue as somebody was reading the Torah and think about it. First question If I was standing by and the Lord spoke to Moses, what would I actually see or hear? Second question If God spoke to me, what would it be like? Uh, I was not questioning in the sense of doubting anything. I just wanted to know what it is all about. It seemed to me something very hard to understand. I was quite sure at the time that all great people like chief rabbis, archbishops and all that, they would know what it is and it would be able to explain to me. Uh, in the course of my life, uh, several years since then, I've met a number of archbishops and a number of chief rabbis and not many of them can explain, but that's beside the point. Incidentally, this uh, handsome looking fellow is not me. At that age, I had curly, 
ginger hair, believe it or not. Now, okay, so my orientation, Jewish background, synagogue, etc. But producing a book like this, I, I, I now and then I want to try and step back and out of my own personal orientation and what does it look like from outside? Somebody looking at the world and what's going on. So um, at about the same time that I was thinking those thoughts, I was sent off in the summer holidays from my native city of Cardiff to an aunt who lived in Croydon in the south of London. And um, she packed me off to some friends of hers who uh, had a, a something called the Strand Magazine, which most of you may have heard of, many of you may have heard of. And you've certainly heard of one of the most famous authors who wrote for it, who was Arthur Conan Doyle. So these bound volumes of the Strand Magazine, including the volume from 1892, had stories by Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes. That's introduced me to Sherlock Holmes. But there was somebody else in the same magazine who's been completely forgotten by the rest of the world, a man called James Frank Sullivan. And he wrote something that's captured my imagination, even if nobody else noticed it. He was writing about two spirits. He was not a spiritual man, by the way, a very secular man. But these two spirits, one was called William, one was called James. I can't guess why. And on the brow of one who might have passed for the elder was the cold and passionless calculation of science. The eye was deeply reflective but unimpassioned. The demeanour was grave and deliberate. The younger one, James, is of a different stamp in him. The quick and well-opened eye, the mobile brown mouth, the eager voice denoted enthusiasm and enterprise. And this stuck in my mind. And when I was writing the book just about two or three years ago, I thought, I must get these. I, I want something independent. An extraordinary experience. Looking at a magazine online, I managed to get a copy of it, and the very words which he used came back. It must have made a tremendous impression on me as, as a, a, a boy of 12 or so. So every now and then these appear in the book. And they... Um, the, the younger one wants to make a world with people and see what the consequences are. Uh, they're going to be nice, good people there and this, that and the other. And the older one, William, tells him, don't waste your time. It's going to be rubbish. All they'll do is fight each other, etc., etc. OK, so I present them in my second chapter and they start. They make a big bang. The universe has started. Forget that for the time being. The, the ma first major part, which is part two, is what words do. What's going on when we use word like God? Uh, does everybody mean the same thing? Is it a fixed name? I mean, well, what, what is it? So I have to devote quite a lot of the book to talking about language. Question number one is a simple question, or it sounds simple. And it is raised in the club because a few of the chapters are constructed as dialogues uh, in a club which I invent, which is some of you will recognize as an academic club. Uh, and I'm poking a bit of fun at the sort of candidates who are there. If you're an academic yourselves, you'll recognize a lot of them. But whatever it is, one of them is an expert in, in language. And um, so he, they're chatting about where does the word God come from? And he tells them, you can find out yourself if you look in the OED. The link is through Old Norse names for gods, such as Odin, Lombardic as Godan, G softens to this and then whatever it is. So basically what happened was that Bishop Ulfilas translated New Testament, as it happens, into Gothic. And um, in not having a word for God, because they didn't have the same concept that he was used to in, 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 in that society, did the next best thing, which was take the chief God. 
well, Wotan or Wodan or Godan, however it was. And this is where we get our word God from. So it starts as the name of the highest God. Okay, but this is a little bit worrying. It means that the Goths who were receiving the this new religion through the bishop uh, didn't have the concept of God at all. And he's trying to introduce it to them. But do they understand what he's saying? Well, I don't know. We have to learn a lot more about language before we can tell whether just using a word like that works. So um, our linguistic friend uh, this time is meeting up with a group of students and asking them, well, what's language? A collection of signifiers? Is it a grooming activity like one of my Oxford, Oxford colleagues has uh, claimed. And um, what about structuralism and all this sort of stuff with which you, many of you would have heard about? So I have to have a chapter about these things, sort of dialogue between Lawrence and, and his students. And um, in the course of it, I deny the notion of the universal grammar and do other sort of um, ingenious things in, in that topic. But we move on. And it leads us to ask about translations. Are translations equivalent? Uh, let's take a psalm. I have two translations here of some of the verses of Psalm 82, a psalm of Asa. King James Version, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods which sort of suggests there are lots of gods there, but he's, he's, he's the most biggest and most important one. Here's another translation from our late chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, a psalm of Asaph. God stands in the divine assembly. Among the judges, he delivers judgment. Uh, but it says here among the gods, and there it says among the judges. Oh dear, who's right and who's wrong? And it turns out that they're both right in the sense that they represented what it says in the Hebrew text. But the word is variously used for God in the plural or for the gods, meaning the pagan gods, the gods who are followed by the pagan. Or it can even be used as a term for judges. Um, the translator has to choose. So they're both right. And again, we, we highlight the difficulty of conveying an idea through a word. What are words? Are words just labels for something? If they were, well, we would, we would be able to fix it. And this raises the whole question of the nature of language. Is language simply a series of signs that fit discrete objects or acts or whatever it is or not? And language is much more complex than that. So um, this was discovered when people first tried to automate translation. And the first translators, decoders, who were actually uh, in, in the context short, shortly after the Second World War, first attempts were made, assumed that, well, you can treat languages as codes for the same thing, alternative codes. So as long as you've got a list for the code, you've just set it up and equivalent and just change one to the other. But it didn't work. You get nonsense. And um, nobody does it that way nowadays. You simply have huge quantities of material in each language, find something similar, and the translation is approximated. Um, but you can try this experiment yourselves. Take some uh, some English. Now, I, I took a piece of English here. In the meantime, the warning bells raised by Amy are not bad enough to make us rip our kids' touch screens away and move to Amish country. It's rather idiomatic English. Um, warning that don't let kids sit in front of their screens too long at a time. Practice moderation instead. So I took this 
and ask Google to translate it into a number of languages, including Japanese. And then I uh, thought I'd take the Japanese and put it back into English. And I made a mistake, which please don't make yourselves when you try the experiment, which was just feeding it straight back in, and I got perfect English out. What had happened was the machine had stored the original English. You have to save, switch off, try again, and then do that. So doing that, um, I got the Japanese translated back into English, and what came out is nonsense. It's not good to go to Amish countries. No, it's not what it says there. Uh, warning bells and children in the United States. I don't even know what, what, what some of it means. So it's not easy to translate automatically, especially if how do you know how the words relate to what you're trying to convey? Very difficult when you're talking about something like God. Now, not a new problem. Look what happened to poor old Spinoza. Any of you who read Spinoza, you probably start with, with Spinoza's ethics, all about God. It earned him a reputation as an atheist. And for a century or more, he was regarded as an, an, as an atheist. He mustn't follow Spinoza. Even those people who did take an interest in Spinoza often had to conceal it. Um, but come the German Romantic movement, and they started rereading him. And he's described as a Gottbetrunken Mensch, a man intoxicated with God. How can both of these accounts be true? Well, uh, it all depends on what Deus means. Yeah, true, he uses the expression Deus sive natura, which sounds as if he's equating God with nature, but he distinguishes also between natura naturans and, and uh, what's the other one, and, um, naturata, uh, and he clearly is distinguishing, if you read him carefully, between God and, and nature. Um, so, you're crazy. So I discussed Spinoza mainly to bring out the point about the difficulty of understanding how people are using a word. Are they talking about the same thing? Are all believers talking about the same thing? In the book, I have a, a long passage from Maimonides, the great uh, Jewish uh, philosopher of the Middle Ages. And Maimonides is going on about people who claim they believe in God, but they think he's in, he is has material. He is made of, of material, uh, material form. So they don't believe in God at all. He calls them atheists, and they responded and said just the opposite. Very difficult. Ah, well, discussing words and what they're doing, um, didn't seem to help. So I come on to the next part of the book. I'm going to try something else. If words can't do it, can't denote something definite, what about stories? Maybe stories are better, because this is what people have always used. You use narratives. And with a narrative, you can convey something, and, and maybe, maybe that'll work. So we try that. And in this part, I review a lot of stories coming eventually to some of those in, in the Bible as well, which I'll comment on. So, um, where are we? AI, OMG. Ah, oh, yes. Um, well, I think we're still a bit, little bit with language. The child writes in her thing in, on, on her iPad, OMG, because she's been surprised by something. Oh, my God. Uh, so you can machine, you program a machine quite easily to respond to an appropriate input with OMG. But um, uh, is there any understanding going on here? So we'll come back to the child. If she takes part in a real life conversation with people who profess belief in God, she'll learn how to construct sentences of her own with the word God in them, like, 
because similar grammar to mummy, daddy, and personal names in general. You need extra room, so you can't say things like God was riding his bicycle. But to make sure the child knows the right grammar, doesn't say the wrong thing, she can even be schooled in a catechism and told what the right things to say about God. Does she really understand what she's saying? If she does, does she believe it? Questions which are very difficult to, to answer. How do we know that we're talking about the same thing and believing it and whatever? So I come on to my stories. And it's interesting that uh, I quote somebody, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, who, who has tried to reduce all the stories in the world to about seven or eight, whatever it is. Uh, I think there are more than that, but a lot of stories occur repeatedly. Almost every culture has some sort of myth of origin, a story of origin. So I discuss four, put them side by side and see what they have in common. There's one from Central America, one from Mesopotamia, a Chinese one, and uh, the Indian horse sacrifice. Discussion of those and what they are saying. But that might leave you with the impression, oh, these are ancient myths, and we gave up on that. We, we, we got scientific. And indeed, in ordinary conversation, if you say to somebody, that story is a myth, really, you're, you're, you're saying, oh, well, it's nonsense. But to an anthropologist, a myth is a very important thing indeed, something to be taken very seriously. In some sense, it conveys truth. So we go back to my club now and we play another game and this game uh, somebody hands out cards on each card is one of these terms nationhood money and so on and at the club in turn each person is asked to take the card at random and talk about it as one of the myths of the secular age because our society today I show in this chapter, is equally dependent on myth in the sense of stories that we tell or concepts that we have, which are very, very important to us, and yet which we cannot tie down. We find them impossible to define. I mean, think of money. Uh, COVID, we learned uh, to ask, what is money? It's not obviously not the stuff we put in our pockets. Uh, we manage without that. Uh, and so on. Uh, and what is nation? Does a nation exist or is it simply a social construct of some sort? Still very important. And um, rights of man. This is one of them, the equality. Universal human rights. We all have uh, equal rights. So I've taken three paragraphs from the Declaration of the, the Rights of Man, 1789. Uh, and uh, look at how they are expressed and ask, well, are there something which can be defined absolutely? Or does it become impossible to get a definition? But we still use that concept because it points us in a certain direction. So um, each one of these I have rewritten to say it doesn't actually quite mean equality. It's something else. Let's have a look. Social distinctions may be based only upon general usefulness. We're trying to say that everybody is equal in society. But if I express that differently, I think it's equivalent, there will be different classes of people based on general usefulness. So what are we saying? <laughs> we all know about uh, um, we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. But inevitably, that turns out to be the case. Or no man may be accused, arrested, or detained except in the cases determined by law. My emphasis again. But rewrite that. Some people will be arrested contrary to their will. Uh, no one is to be disquieted because of his opinions, provided their manifestation does not disturb the public order. Uh, we've had a, a case of this today, I think, with the Suella Braverman and the um, 
uh, you know, protests, this sort of thing. Uh, you can have any opinion you like, but as long as it's not going to cause trouble. So if anyone has opinions that might provoke others to violence, they should refrain from expressing them. So we never quite have a definable equality. Nevertheless, the idea of equality is very important and guides us in, in decisions that we make. It has the status in modern culture of a, a myth in the ancient world. That's the argument presented in that chapter. Um, okay, so I, I discuss here how we de survive disasters. So no, I won't go into that one now. But uh, I did not include in that chapter the sort of fairly obvious one, the story of the flood as it is in Genesis. And in fact, I did not include Genesis at all in the previous two chapters. And the reason for that is that I think that Genesis is not one of the um, ancient collections of myths. In fact, it is very much concerned with demythologizing the topic of, of creation. So let's look at it. I think most people who are present will be very thoroughly familiar with the text. So uh, six days of creation we have. And what is created? Light and darkness, the sky to separate the upper waters from below. Sea and land are separated and there's vegetation, sun, moon and stars, creatures of sea and sky and land animals, humans, male and female. All those, note, are things which you can see. Uh, I and mean, you can't see darkness, but you things which, which you experience directly. Um, but uh, I compare this to what happens if you are, for instance, arranging a wedding. You draw up a list of the guests to be invited. And often more interesting than the guest list is the list of people who you are not inviting. And if I was living 3,000 years ago when this story came forward, probably a bit less than 3,000, know, whatever, uh, I would expect some other guests to have been invited, some other things to have been created. For instance, these. Gods, no gods are mentioned. Uh, God is there. Um, demons of some sort. Other intermediate beings. Mythical monsters. The devil, the forces of evil. Where, where are they? They don't seem to be in the chapter. They are not invited to the party. And another striking omission, uh, and these are mentioned later on, uh, in most accounts of of, um, of early humanity, and the gods are present, and uh, two things, and and the arts and technologies are, are attributed to the gods. Uh, for fire is stolen from the gods, and uh, the art of uh, agriculture and so on. Um, but not in Genesis. In, so in fact, it is a critique of the um, mythological uh, accounts of origin um, given the understanding which was available at the time. Obviously, it doesn't go as far as, as we might know. Another element of the critique, which is part of the collection in, in Genesis, um, but look at it with the eyes of people to whom it was first presented. The antediluvians, Adam, Seth, and so on. A modern person looking at that is going to say, 930, 912, <laughs> ridiculous, you know, what ages? Um, enormous ages that people live. But an ancient who first heard Genesis would not have reacted in quite the same way. First of all, people before the flood, uh, they were divine beings, weren't they? You'd expect them to live a long time. Um, the surprise would not be how long they lived, but
But how short? So if you look at the Sumerian king list, the anti, another list of antediluvians, people who lived before the flood, uh, in the tens of thousands. So what Genesis is saying is they were not divine beings. No one lived even a thousand years. So I think we have to reread Genesis as a creation of the so-called axial period in which the older mythological ideas are being subjected to criticism. And um, it is applying some sort of corrective to that. Um, it's very easy to misread Genesis, partly because occasionally you get something from the old, from the earlier time slipping in. Um, the the sons of gods and the daughters of man or something. There are odd verses like that. So it isn't entirely consistent. But the thrust is pretty clear as uh, demythologizing of the earlier account. But we must move on. So, um, okay, so Genesis came along and one God and the Bible and everything else and uh, other cultures as well were talking about the one who is behind all the multiplicity of things. And it gradually it seems to have come about that some sort of monotheism uh, is very widely accepted in the world. But um, monotheism is difficult to live with. It's not entirely a satisfactory explanation to people in, in their ordinary life of lives of what's going on. Three challenges in particular. The first one and the major one is in fact the presence of evil in the world. If you say there is only one God and God is, is the most good and uh, everything, so why is there evil? The second problem is, um, you might say, is intentionality. We, we see the world as a complex place and all sorts of things are happening. And um, the rain comes down. Why does the rain come down? So we think there must be some entity uh, which uh, has a mind like ours and is chucking rain down and that sort of thing before we've you worked it out. So uh, we we need more beings to, to be doing things. Sheer diversity of human experience follows on from that. So people are actually uncomfortable living with monotheism. Um, now I've got a section there which quickly reviews the unsatisfactory answers that have been given to the problem of evil. Not my main topic now, so, but to look at it. Uh, some of them, Maimonides would be an example, deny that evil has real existence. It's only from our limited perspective. Very <laughs> Not very satisfactory. I remember one day having a bad toothache and thinking, oh, Maimonides says that evil doesn't really exist. It was not convincing. Uh, you might say, like Leibniz, still today people doing the same Arvin planting as an example, that a world with freely choosing beings, hence the possibility of evil, is the best logically possible. Otherwise you couldn't have anybody choosing freely. Throw the responsibility for evil onto human beings. Again problematic. After all, God made human nature. You could say that evil is ultimately for our benefit. Hardly looks as if that's so in this world, so you'll need another world to do that. Or frankly state that God is inscrutable. And there are various compromise ways. Um, well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the sort of arguments that have been put forward, but it leaves you a bit uncomfortable and it's easier if you invoke some other beings to do something somewhere. And gradually, I argue in the book, the gods return. First of all, in the form of angels. This happens in the Bible already. You know, we get angels who've got to come in to do various odd jobs. Um, but you have saints uh, who can intervene and do things for you. 
the devil turns up somewhere, uh, very prominent in some religions. Um, I, how many times I had the argument, uh, uh, people tell me, weren't the devil's already in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, tempts Eve. Please read Genesis again. It doesn't say anything at all about the devil. It says the serpent, and the serpent is is an animal and uh, gets into trouble later on. And anyway, doesn't force Eve to do anything. She acts of her own free will because the tree is beautiful. So it doesn't mention the devil there. Uh, it's true Satan does make a very occasional appearance later in the Bible. Well, but it simply proves my point that the gods return in some form. Demons, very widely believed in. Or even the philosophers talk about emanations, and there's always something. And there's magic, astrology. Ideologies are the most common form nowadays of where the gods return. You have the final answer to the all the world's problems. Heroes, idols of sport, art, and politics. So it's very difficult to be consistent with monotheism. But we've all got to move on because uh, what happens now? James, William and James survey progress in the final part. Ah, they come after nine billion years after the Big Bang and see something's happening. And William is still pessimistic. Don't bet on it. You know, you know, it's going to happen. But now, um, it's fashionable today to talk about passion, being passionate in, in religion, and it seems to be admired. Uh, I, I'm never very happy with passion, and so I spend a chapter talking about it and what's the right place and the wrong place for passion. And uh, I was actually quite amused looking up passion on online, and I found this site, Design Epic Life, 62 things a day which you should be passionate about. I mean, just try. Uh, or even try living with somebody who does that. I mean, it would be awful. So I'm ambivalent with regard to passion. And uh, I like inner calm, careful reason, enthusiasm, and so on. So back to God and the philosophers. What are the philosophers going to do for us? Here I have another conversation set up in the words of the philosophers that I'm quoting, and all of them. The first is purely uh, rational arguments, Thomas Aquinas, five proofs for the existence of God. He's a well-known, and he works through them, and questions are asked. And David Hume turns up as well, and undermines those arguments. Kant uh, this really is refuting the, the ontological argument. Existence is not a predicate, uh, so we can't put in his bit there. And they have a lively conversation between them. And then Darwin turns up, not a philosopher, admittedly, but he actually, he strikes one of the strongest blows against traditional rational theology, which depends, after all, on the idea of God as the great designer, planner, and so on. And what is the challenge of, of Darwin to conventional religion? Most people sort of assume that it's about the age of the earth, because the Bible implies the earth is only 6,000 years old, if that, and uh, Darwin says it's much older. But this is, this wouldn't be such a great challenge. The real challenge is that he comes and proposes a mechanism, if you like, by which complicated things emerge from simplicity without needing a designer, something which is uh, beyond question now. I mean, we, we have numerous examples of it. We can even generate complicated patterns in a machine um, which don't need a designer. They're just the consequence of some simple equation. So um, altogether, the, in my view, the 
traditional philosophical arguments uh, don't hold up very well. And this happened in the 19th century. There is a move already then to talking about religious experience. Uh, Schleiermacher, I'll give as an example, somebody who's focusing on religious experience rather than dogma. And, and intuition in, in his special sense, a special sense of intuition, which means actually having some sort of direct access to the truth. And Kierkegaard, a bit later on, is doing a similar sort of thing, his leap of faith. Uh, it has impact uh, beyond the Christian world, certainly in, in the Jewish world. Um, and the one example I give is that of J.D. Soloveitchik, because I want to say something about him, um, which I need to critique. So um, we, we turn to religious experience. Well, what kind of experiences are we talking about? And I give you four types of religious experience, but they needn't necessarily be religious. Uh, and it may well be that other people who are not religious have similar experiences, but describe them in different language. So born again, discovery, Eureka, Archimedes, suddenly seeing how everything fits together and uh, he can measure the, whatever it was, the density of silver or something. Um, but it's very similar to the religious experience of born again, of suddenly seeing how everything makes sense. Uh, religious examples would be very obvious. And one is Paul of Tarsus, seeing the, the having persecuted Jesus, seeing you no, know, Jesus is right. Or a uh, much more recent one, um, uh, Jewish one, would be uh, Franz Rosenzweig, uh, suddenly seeing. The Judaism made sense to him when he was present at Kol Nidre. Um, so, very common uh, thing, one form of religious experience. It's you see how everything comes together, and this uh, makes sense to you. Awe and mysticism of various kinds, sense of awe. Uh, in the book, I, I though I give as an example of the sense of awe someone who is. A scientist in Antarctica, and she has this sense, and she describes it particularly well. So, um, not I do, whether the person is religious or not, I do not know, but it is the type of experience which is relevant. For me, my prime experience, the religious experience, is much more through peace and tranquility. Shabbat, the Sabbath, that for me is is my religious experience, which I have every week. <laughs> a very simple thing. I mean, how many people have the experience that you, you, you know, you are in this world of, of the spirit. If your phone goes or the something and all the usual things which you trouble, it is not, it is nothing which, which concerns you. you. You are away from it. You don't answer. The phone, you don't look on your screen, none of this. You're in the world of peace and tranquility. So that for me is, is the ideal of religious experience, but that is personal. And I realize with other people, it is quite different. The rhythm of ecstasy. I attend my local synagogue uh, when in London, the uh, local one to us there, and uh, I don't like it because People that uh, kind of go up to sing lustily and dance about and do things like that. But I appreciate that for many, it is the rhythm of ecstasy. This is something which for them brings a religious experience. And we find this in several religious traditions. The two which I, which I cite are uh, the, 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 in, in the Muslim world, the, the dervishes. Uh, and uh, the religious dance and the inspiration which it brings, and uh, likewise in the Jewish world, the, the, where the Hasidim have adopted the uh, dance as a very important element in religious experience. So there we are. 
all very well, but a completely different world now. And we're back in the club, our academic club, and these solemn people come and they have to, they're talking about religious experience. Is it like a drug-induced state? And the second question, if so, does it matter? So we have a lot there about hallucinations, delusions and what's the difference between a delusion and an illusion and so on and um, I must cut that one short now what comes in the end the answer uh, is yes it's a bit like a drug-induced state and uh, but no it doesn't matter and um, so well that's a rather technical chapter and read it when you have the opportunity much more important to me is, is this, in a way. Uh, it's something which I've battled with all the time and throughout my life and in almost every area of, of learning. Uh, what do we know? In the end, we, we don't know very much. We look for certainty. And many of the problems in life come from either the conviction that we've got certainty, we know for certain, or the search for certainty, rather than living with a certain amount of, of imprecision, doubt, whatever it is. That's what we have to do. So I'm dismissive of ontology and epistemology. How do we know we know and what is out there? So I uh, worked through a number of um, philosophers who had things to say. Religion, people claim certainty for definitions of doctrine or for eternal laws. And, but is it possible? Are there such things as laws which can be expressed in a form which is valid for any possible society? I argue that this is, it is not possible. We have pointers, but we cannot have absolute laws. Um, <laughs> a very simple example. If you ask people, what law is absolute? Oh, you mustn't murder. Now, murder is not an absolute term. The law doesn't, uh, the, the, the Ten Commandments actually say do not murder. They do not say do not kill. You could not have a law which says do not kill because there are circumstances where it might be right to kill. So murder means we are limiting the law to those to exclude those circumstances where it would be right to kill. So there do not seem to be absolutes in that way. We, we have approximations, not certainty. So like grains of sand, the harder you squeeze, the less remains in your hand. We must relinquish our grip on absolutes and learn to live with a degree of uncertainty. Um, something about the ways of God talk, ancient, medieval, modern. That is typical of ancient, medieval, and modern, although all three are in use by people still today. Ancient, read the Bible, highly anthropomorphic, God is described in perfectly human terms, located in space, has strong emotions, attends to detail, is attended by courtiers, and all this sort of thing. Um, in the course of the Axial Age and by the Middle Ages, this became unacceptable. So we find that anthropomorphisms of the Bible and uh, of other works, same thing happened with Homer, are allegorized. And um, God can't quite be where it can't quite be located in space in the way that it happened in earlier times. However, you do have a convenient cosmology, the spheres, uh, the Earth in the center, and various spheres around with the moon and the sun and stars, and the Empyrean heaven which can be occupied by God and drives with love, drives the rest of the spheres. Very nice. Or you, you use some theory of emanations, perhaps ultimately derived through from Plotinus, who 
uh, was not Christian or Jew, whatever it is, but the root of being. But that didn't work. Um, disenchantment of the heavens, the, um, disenchantment of the experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the heavens have stopped being a different type of region made of something which is not ordinary matter. Uh, made of the same stuff as, as the rest of the universe. So it isn't that there's somewhere up there that God can reside. It doesn't make any sense anymore. We speak of him as transcendent or as immanent. And as we give a prime role to personal experience. Now, does this mean that religion has changed completely from biblical times? And what I want to say there is no. The institutions of religion, in fact, bind together these various ways of talking, the various narratives, and they may be interpreted differently by different people, but stories, ritual, can remain constant throughout. So uh, I do put a sort of conclusion in, because you're supposed to do that in a book, and editors don't like it if you haven't. Although I firmly believe that to travel hopefully is better than to arrive, and what I've been describing is my own journey. But I can say, scriptures are read in a community. Prayers are intoned, stories are told, rituals performed, and the way of talk remains constant. So the language of God retains power within a community, and the sacred becomes manifest, inspiring all respect and devotion. But at the same time, the theology is very changeable. Um, it can interpret traditional talk in different ways. And even in one and the same community, you will have differences among theologians, one this way, one that way, one the other way. So, there we are. That, I think, concludes the book, and we click to exit, and I stop share. Thank you very much. I guess uh, all of us have probably heard some of that stuff. I doubt whether many of us have heard all of it, so we've all been given things to think about uh, through that amazing journey that you have taken us through, uh, through your own life, Norman, so we thank you very much for it. We have uh, five minutes or so for some questions. So if anybody would like to put up a hand or um, put something in the uh, chat, then we will um, let Norman respond to it. And you have um, introduced us to a wide range uh, of insights and questions. Uh, and it's neat that you have ended up with um, noting how the Bible itself introduces us to such a wide range of insights and questions about God uh, and we are grateful to you. Just say good night and we will see you the next time. Thank you again to Norman. Thank you John. Bye. Thank you Norman. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.